I'd like to thank all of our presenters and participants joining us for our McCourt School of Public Policy's LEAD Conference. You have our deep gratitude for your extraordinary contributions and engagement. I wish to offer my special thanks to our Dean Ed Montgomery of McCourt School for the support of this important conference. It's a privilege to gather with all of you this morning to hear insights from the inaugural awardee of our Janet Reno Women's Leadership Award, Ms. Marion Wright Edelman. I'll speak more about Ms. Edelman in just a few moments, but first I wish to provide a context for this morning's event and to share just a few words about the work of our Janet Reno Endowment. We launched this endowment last June through our Center for Juvenile Justice Reform in our McCourt School of Public Policy to support our university's efforts to develop compassionate and thoughtful future leaders and to honor Attorney General Reno's commitment to our nation's youth and families. The most pervasive and persistent challenges facing our child welfare and juvenile justice systems require collaboration between community leaders at the national, state, and local levels. This endowment will better enable the diverse group of faculty, researchers, and students on our hilltop to reach beyond our campus and to undertake important efforts to improve the lives of disadvantaged youth and families. Today's award, which is sponsored by the Janet Reno Endowment, honors Attorney General Reno's distinguished public service in her lifelong advocacy for justice and equality. In a 1996 address to the National Recreation and Park Association, she explained her commitment to our nation's youth, saying, and I quote, we're all in this together, and we all have to make an investment in our most precious possession and in the foundation of our future, our young people, end quote. As we come together to reflect upon her tireless efforts to promote the foundation of our future, we are reminded of how her legacy continues to inspire others. And it's in this spirit that we recognize the inaugural awardee of the Janet Reno Women's Leadership Award, Marion Wright Edelman. For more than 40 years, she has been an advocate for our nation's children and in seeking to address racial justice in our nation. She has sought to ensure that children across our country can live with dignity, working to end child poverty, to ensure access to education and to respond to injustices in our juvenile justice system. A graduate of Spelman College and Yale Law School, she became the first black woman admitted to the Mississippi Bar. She went on to direct the NAACP's Legal Defense and Educational Fund office in Jackson, Mississippi, and later moved to Washington to serve as counsel for the Poor People's Campaign, which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had begun organizing before his death. In 1973, she founded the Children's Defense Fund to provide a voice for the youth of our nation, especially those who are poor, disabled, or in need of support. She has received many awards over the years for her dedicated advocacy for disadvantaged Americans, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the MacArthur Foundation Prize Fellowship, the Heinz Award, and the Albert Schweitzer Humanitarian Prize. She is a transformative leader and a tireless advocate dedicated to ensuring the well-being of all of our children, especially those from disadvantaged backgrounds. We have, here at Georgetown have been fortunate to have Marion and her husband Peter as part of our large, larger Georgetown family, and today we are truly honored to recognize her extraordinary contributions with this inaugural award. It's an honor to welcome her today to present her with the first Janet Reno Endowment Women's Leadership Award. Our community, our city, and our nation is strengthened by her commitment to social welfare, to civic responsibility, and to the common good. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present Mary Wright Edelman with the inaugural Janet Reno. Thank President DeJoya for his leadership 
Until we confront the birth defects of slavery and Native American genocide and exclusion of all women from the electoral process and exclusion of the poor, we're never going to be able to get a, get a racial discrimination, the kind of things upon us. And I just, his leadership as a college president in recognizing and trying to overcome the barriers that have been created by slavery is just unprecedented. And I told him to thank you. And if every college president is going to be there, he would be I'm so honored. I just loved Janet Reno. I miss Janet Reno. And I love what you're trying to do to remember her. She would be so pleased with what Maggie has been doing. You all had a great mama. I had a great mama. People ask me why I do what I do. I said, I, I do exactly what my parents do. And I, you know, I never had a chance, never thought that I wouldn't do this. Um, growing up in a small southern town, but it is um, everything I do at Children's Defense Fund comes out of my childhood experiences as a black child in this place, but with the example of community leaders. And so I'm just so grateful for the leadership that's coming out of this institute for your the shade, um, for Maggie carrying on Janet's legacy, for the advisory board, and let me just shout out to one of my own board members, which we share, Carol Biondi, if we could clone her. We would have won people crazy all around the country, but I cannot be more honored than to be here with your advisory board members, with your center, with Maggie, with, um, and at this place. And thank you for your work. And I hope that the one big thing that we will do to remember Janet and to carry on her work is just to reaffirm that we are never going to go backwards. We're going to go forward. And nobody's going to carry us backwards. So if you see a crazy lady out here, you know, it's going to be that. This is, um, boy, how I miss Janet. She was honest, which was a quality I hope we can rediscover in our political leadership today. She was straightforward. She was ground to earth. Um, she said what she meant, and she meant what she said. Um, and it really is just, it's, um, she cared about people and she cared about children, and she cared about children and young people who were left behind and falling through the cracks, which is why I'm so grateful for the work of this center and for the presence of all of you here today. Um, and she lived, she, 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 she believed, as I do, that children in good facts that undergird good policy and that undergird good practice, and all of those had to be in place. And all of us as individuals should just want for other people's children what we want for our own. And we'll never, ever then fail. But it is good parenting translated into good policy. And I cannot express my thanks to you enough for your attempt to put together the pieces of the whole child. Children don't come in pieces, and God did not make two classes of children. And so we need to be mindful of that all the way is our guiding principle as we move forward. Um, she loved the kayak um, and to have fun. Um, and um, I just, um, and she loved other people's children um, and understood that there was no such thing as other people's children, that all children are our own. And I just love thinking about her as a role model. And most of all, I just appreciate the, the legacy of honesty. Um, which is the, probably the most important thing, to say the truth, to see the truth, and to act on that truth. And boy, is that in short supply and too much of our political life today. But you are here, and I'm so grateful that you are carrying on this legacy, so I thank you. I thank you for your focus on strong research and um, thoughtful policies um, that address the needs of the whole child. And we're going to get there, and we're going to end the two-tiered society. I am not going to make a long speech this morning because I just wanted to come here to say thank you. We should all be more like Janet and follow her example. We should all make sure that we are not intimidated by temporary changes in the politics. Let's just keep our eye on what children need. It doesn't matter who's in that White House. It does. It's keep your eye on the And we are absolutely have to turn, we're not going to turn back and, and we just have to stay there talking about what 
children need the greatest national, economic, and military security problem we face is not from some external enemy. It's from our failure to invest in educated children and healthy children. And we have got to make that our clarion call throughout the nation. What kind of military and what kind of political leadership and anything we're going to have if we continue to let a majority of all of our children in all racial and income groups and 75% of our Latino children who are an increasing part of the population, over 80% of our black children, grow up unable to read and compute at regular levels or decent levels in fourth grade and eighth grade. Children can't read and compute in this country and in this world are uh, being sentenced to economic and social death. And that's what we call that cradle to prison pipeline. And we got to kind of keep our mind and we're going to break it up. And it has to start with ending child poverty. And we're going to end child poverty. And let's just keep that as a disgrace that we let our children be the poorest group of Americans. Um, but it is the jugular of whether America is going to lead in this world as the majority of our children become non-white and increasingly poor. And so let's just keep our eyes and prize. This is not something just because it's the right thing to do for individual children. That's the most important thing because every child is sacred, but because the country's future military and economic security depends on it. Over 70% of our children can't get in the military. 74% can't get in the military because they can't read or compute. Um, and are not able to get in. What kind of military are we going to have? Um, and so this, you, you just be confident um, that you're doing the most important work that you could be doing as a, as a caring American and as a decent citizen. And for those of us who are people of faith, I think we're doing God's work. And so let's just don't be deterred by any temporary changes in politics. Just keep your eye on that child and stand up and fight back and don't go backwards. And I just want to um, congratulate you. I'm sort of just trying to see the whole child. I'm trying to do what you're doing and coming together like this. But I just also just hope don't 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 get discouraged. Do what you know what you're doing. Um, she's tough. We're tough. Um, and there's nothing more important than saving a child's life and saving our children's lives and saving our nation's future and helping us honor our code. I want to just, I'm not going to, my staff did me a policy speech, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to end with a scratch. With, 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 I'm into the scratch line. My friend Sam Proctor. Samuel DeWitt Proctor was a great preacher, uh, college president, a great civil rights leader, and he ran a Peace Corps country um, in Africa, and then he um, um, was pastor of the Abyssinian Baptist Church, and in his last years, he was our first minister in residence at the Alex Haley Farm, which is our most important quiet under radar screen work. Um, and he, and we named our great preacher institute after him, the Samuel Hewitt Proctor Institute. And when he opened, when we opened Alex Haley Farm, where we're training the next generation of servant leaders. We're gonna have our next movement, but they have to be seated. You know, you have to water them, you have to fertilize them, you have to have a whole lot of them, and some of them gonna die, and you, you know the parable of so on. Um, but we got a whole lot of good young servant leaders coming up in all of our specters. And so nurturing that new generation of leaders, and nobody's been better than that again than Carol. We have a BTR program. We now have 610 kids who've gone through the BTR scholarship program. They do it in California. And this year, California produced from 2011 our first Rhodes Scholar, whose daddy is in prison for murder, but he's going off to Oxford next year. And he's one of those young, young he can be, but he's going to be a part of changing the structures of the society. And so you've got to have good servant leaders who know it's not about them, but who are really focused on the policy piece and the practice piece and the mobilization piece. And so I just hope that you will stay encouraged in this very difficult time. I am more than ever determined that we're going to end poverty, but we're going to start with ending child poverty in this country and make sure that every child gets what they need to grow up wholesome and helpful. And so I just want to end with a story about the, 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 the piece of the sermon that Sam Proctor preached in his first inaugural address on Kelly Farm. And it was called the Scratch Line. He said, we don't all start at the same scratch line, although there's one original position hypothetically for everybody. You were born here owning nothing, having earned nothing, just born. There you are helpless. You are indebted to everybody, but some of us opened our eyes and saw nothing but blessings just dumping on us. 
I opened my eyes and there was Herbert and Thelma and my grandma Hattie, a slave in Chesterfield County in 1882, smiling at me. How in the world could I lose? Taught me how to read and sing four-part harmony before I ever got to school. Taught me how to play the clarinet and the piano. Made me go to Sunday school. Daddy didn't send us, Daddy took us to Sunday school and there was nobody in the Sunday school but one person that would have been my daddy with his little six children. Others in the Sunday school at the Bank Street Baptist Church. That's what I inherited. I didn't earn it. You can't get that with a visa card. It was given to me. Now all through my neighborhood, there were other young fellows. I could remember all of them. Daddies were not always there all the time and sometimes drunk. They didn't read in their homes. Nobody went to Sunday school, none of that. They started life below the scratch line. I started life way above the scratch line. And everywhere I went, someone said, aren't you Miss Hattie's grandson? Aren't you Herbert's boy? Skipped three grades, never was in the third or the fifth grade or the seventh grade. Everything smiling on me. Finished high school at 15, went on to college on a scholarship. None of that did I deserve. I hadn't earned any of it. I started out with a head of steam. They had trained my mother and father, learned poetry I did, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and they gave all that to us in great abundance. And my buddies at the street had none of that. Now we want to make these bones live again, and this was about can these bones live again, those of us who have inherited benefits that we did not earn or deserve need to turn around and help those who inherited deficits that they did not earn or deserve and help them to rise up to the scratch line where we are so that they may earn and enjoy all the benefits that we so take for granted. Can these bones live again, O oh Lord, even in the midst of the political turmoil that we face today? These bones can live and I really want you never, ever to forget that no matter what goes on, God did not create two classes of children. Every child is sacred. And every child deserves what, every, what we are able and blessed to give to our own children. And if we don't save our children, we're not gonna be able to save our nation's soul or our nation's future. And so you have the most important work in the world. And you recognize through this institute that children don't come in pieces. You recognize through honoring Janet Reno in this wonderful way um, the qualities that we all need to have as leaders, um, and I'm so grateful for that. And we honor, we honor her by our persistence. It doesn't matter what the weather is outside, um, or the political weather is outside. You just keep your eye on that child. And despite the ugliness that we're facing now, let's just keep pressing forward to make sure that every child gets health care. 95% of all children have coverage. We've got to keep it. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to keep it. They're not going to have it. They can't have it. Our children are going to keep that health care. We're going to move it until we have a universal system for our children and everybody else. And so let's just, just determine, don't worry less, let, worry less about what they're going to do and more about what we're going to do. And let's just keep our boys that Medicaid and SHIP and, and ACA safety net, and let's just determine to do that and you just, 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 just make, a, make a ruckus, um, but also be strategic in your ruckus and well researched in your ruckus. They can't have um, Head Start and the early childhood struggles that we've had to invest in our children and get ready for school. And let's just determine we're going to take that piece and we're going to keep it in place each of us not trying to do everything, but being strategic and saying we're going to connect, but we're going to keep building a high quality early childhood system. Let's put into place a decent education system because our education system needs to make sure that we are not creating new generations of children not prepared to, to exist in the world. And so work with the education lobby, but we don't all have to try to do everything. And the most vulnerable is in the child welfare system. You know, we've got to get there. Uh, we, we come very close, but, but, but the, we've got to break up the cradle to prison pipeline. And so we've not only got to see the whole child and make sure that there's what's available through our public policies and private sector policies, what we want for our children, but we also have to make sure that there's a continuum of care, from prenatal care, home visiting, and all the other, to high quality early childhood, to first rate education for every child, 
And for those children who have fallen into bad times and gone into the child welfare and juvenile justice system, make sure that that's their ways back into the community and into the future because we don't have the right to give up on any child. And so you're doing the most important work in the world, but the best defense is an offense. And so I hope while we're trying to hold on to what we've had and got, we will then move on with our positive vision and we will get there. There is nothing more important than our children. And we should want for every child what we want for our own children. And so just be confident be grateful for what you've been able to do. Be grateful for what you're going to do. Be grateful for the example of great leaders like Janet Reno, who just did not back down on anything that was right, um, and who kept pushing forward. And just let think about it when you want to give up. And get up after you cry, but just keep going forward. Let me just end with the Sojourner Truth. I wear every day around my neck these two ladies. And people say, who are they? Um, I say that one of them is Harriet Tubman. And Harriet Tubman was, both of these women were said to be functionally literal, literate, but they were brilliant. And you know she ran the Underground Railroad, and she boasted that she never lost a passenger. Um, and I don't know of any bus company or airline company. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think about old Harriet Tubman, um, and the thing that was important about her is that she got to the free land, she made sure she went back to bring other people. And so we just have to remember that we are part of a broader hold here and that we can't protect our own children without protecting other people's children. All of our children have to walk down the streets. All of our children have to be a part of the society. But remember, I just remember Harry Tubman. She didn't have traditional education, but she could read that North Star and get to freedom, and she did her job in life. And so I figured if she could do what she does, I can do what I do um, here in Washington. We talk about it. It's not, you don't know from heart. And Sojourner Truth is my other favorite role model. She was too perceived to be functionally illiterate, but she was absolutely brilliant, and she was the most determined advocate I ever know. The great stories about how she insisted on riding the, the trolley cars here in Washington, which were excluded, and where, from which um, black folk and, and former slaves were excluded. And she would get on the trolley car and jump on, the conductor would stop the trolley car, put her off, and she would run to the next stop, um, to try to get there by the time the trolley car got there, and then she would get back on again, and he had to keep putting her off the trolley car, but she wore them down. When she was, she was very eloquent, and when she was going to speak to a group of folk, um, they threatened to burn down the hall, and she said, then I will speak to the ashes. Um, but she not, let nothing deter her. But my favorite role model story from Sojourner Truth was one day when she was speaking out against slavery, which was an impossible cause back then, allegedly, um, and she got heckled by an old white man who stood up and said, old slave woman, I don't care more about your anti-slavery talk than for an old flea bite. And she said, that's all right, and Lord willing, I'm going to keep you scratching. <laughs> we all want to make big differences, and we all must make big differences. Janet Reno made big differences, set a different tone. Um, for the role of justice and making children a priority. Um, and, but you know, what we all just need to be committed to is to be persistent, strategic fleas. <laughs> I've watched the flea corps for children grow over the last decades, and it gets your legislation. You just bite, bite with your votes. Stand outside the bathroom when they come off the floor and lobby them. Just be, wear them down and let them know that you're not gonna go away until they do what is right for children. And while 50 years of progress are now on the chopping board, they can't have them. And we've gotta make sure that we protect the infrastructure of the laws first, that we don't try to do everything, that we collaborate with the people who are gonna be doing education, that we can do child welfare. We've gotta to work together, it's not about us. It's about building the political clout for children. And so let's just make the commitment that we're gonna be strategic fleas Enough fleas biting strategically. If some of them get flicked off, we all get another group come back. But let's just see ourselves as part of a moral flea corn. Let's <laughs> we wear them down for our children. So just be encouraged, be determined. Remember Janet Reno and what she would be doing now if she were living in this terrible time, and this is a terrible time. But I will tell you, we should not dare let our grandchildren and our children 
have to fight these fights all over again. So let's get out there and do what we've got to do to keep moving forward and don't let anybody turn us around. Thank you so much for the